Continuing now on this special Veterans Day edition of Newsmax Prime as we look back to November 11th, 1918, Armistice Day, ending what was then called the Great War. It's the subject of tonight's American Moment. It was called the war to end all wars, but instead it only served as a prelude of worse things to come. It was the world's first universal war, with the nations of the United States, United Kingdom, France, Greece, Italy, Russia, and 19 other countries declaring war on Austria-Hungary, Bulgaria, Germany, the Ottoman Empire, and the other European-based nations. As the wars before it, and those after it, this war would prove to be a long, bloody, and costly conflict. For the first time, chemical weapons were used in organized warfare. In 1950, the Germans unleashed 150 tons of chlorine gas at Ypres, Belgium. Then two years later, used mustard gas against the Russians at Riga. World War I also gave birth to a new form of battle called trench warfare. Opposing armies would build elaborate trenches opposite one another, protected by barbed wire. The trenches themselves became havens for disease and life-threatening infections due to poor drainage and sanitation. The area between the opposing armies became known as no man's land because it was fully exposed to artillery and small arms fire from both armies. Attacks, even if successful, often sustained severe casualties for both sides. So when it finally came to an end, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month at 1918, soldiers from both sides greeted the news with great skepticism. Neither side dared to let themselves believe their long nightmare had finally come to an end, leaving an estimated eight and a half million people dead and some 21 million wounded. The actual peace document, known as the Treaty of Versailles, was not signed until six months later, on the 28th of June, 1919. Although the face of the civilized world had forever changed, 21 short years later, history would again repeat itself. For Newsmax TV, I'm Bill Curtis, and this is an American Moment. When it comes to wartime and military success, a lot of it stems from intelligence gathering. Before there was a CIA, there was the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, and the man in charge was Wild Bill Donovan. In a new book entitled Disciples, Author Scott Waller writes about four men who worked under Wild Bill and who went on to become a director of the CIA. These four men were Alan Dulles, Richard Helms, William Colby, and William Casey, all of whom became uh, very controversial CIA directors in their time. But before they took the top job of the CIA, they served under Wild Bill Donovan's OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, during World War II, and that was Franklin Roosevelt's spy service. Alan Dulles ran a very successful uh, station in Bern, Switzerland, where he launched uh, a number of operations to collect intelligence inside Germany and also to fund covert movements uh, in occupied France and Italy. Uh, William Colby launched uh, or participated in very daring commando operations in the Bordeaux, uh, I'm sorry, the Burgundy region southeast of France and also in Norway during World War II, very dangerous operations. William uh, Casey, at the young age of 31 years old, was appointed head of all of secret intelligence for Europe by Donovan with a very daunting mission to penetrate Nazi Germany with OSS officers and agents. Uh, 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 Richard Helms was uh, headed up a very uh, dangerous, actually, activity in occupied Berlin shortly after the world, uh, after the war, where he hunted for Nazi war criminals, looked for uh, Nazi uh, 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 stolen art, and eventually started spying on the Russians. Uh, with your indulgence, I'd like to concentrate on two of them, uh, beginning with Alan Dulles. Uh, a famous family name, if I'm not mistaken, retained in his job from the Eisenhower administration, then on into JFK's time in office, 
And yet a lot of the blame for the Bay of Pigs uh, history has put on his doorstep. A, is that fair? And B, what became of Allen in the wake of the Bay of Pigs fiasco? Well, it is somewhat fair. I mean, he launched the operation. Uh, he was faulted for not being a very good administrator uh, at the CIA. He had a lot of ideas and was very energetic. But on this particular operation, he left the oversight of it to a lot of subordinates. That said, the president of the United States at that time, John Kennedy, gave the OK uh, for that operation. So as he said afterwards, he bore ultimate responsibility for it. After uh, the Bay of Pigs fiasco, Dulles stayed on uh, at the agency for about a year. Uh, Kennedy didn't want to fire him uh, right away, although he did say that, uh, reportedly said that he would like to break the CIA up into a million pieces. After uh, uh, Dulles was edged out uh, after a year, he, um, he went on the speaking circuit, did a lot of interviews, still defended his role at the CIA, continued writing books. He was a prolific writer, although not a particularly good writer, and wrote an awful lot about uh, his operations in World War II. His time in Bern, Switzerland, he said, were really the best years of his life uh, during the war. And it's interesting how many people look back to the war, especially in the intelligence community, as being some of their greatest days, not only of public service, but of personal memories. Uh, another name that evokes a lot of memories for me is Bill Casey. Not only his role for Ronald Reagan uh, in Reagan's 1980 campaign, but subsequently his, uh, his confirmation by the Senate. My political mentor, Barry Goldwater, out in Arizona, was really concerned about Bill Casey becoming director of Central Intelligence. What finally carried the day? Was there anything that, that qualmed the Goldwater concerns? Or were those concerns uh, voiced by Barry Goldwater eventually borne out with, during uh, Bill Casey's stewardship? Well, it's interesting. Bill Casey... Uh liked to model himself after Wild Bill Donovan. And he said it, Wild Bill Donovan was his mentor. In fact, he kept two photos or two pictures in his office at Langley uh, hung up there, one of Ronald Reagan and the other one of Wild Bill Donovan. That said, uh, Casey didn't learn all his lessons uh, from Donovan. Donovan was careful to cultivate Congress and the press. Casey despised reporters, and he had uh, did little to hide his contempt uh, of Congress and, uh, you know, not informing them. In fact, Casey had a habit of mumbling, and some people believed he turned on the mumbler when he was testifying before Congress because he didn't really want them to know what he was doing. Uh, that bred kind of a toxic relationship, uh, particularly with Barry Goldwater. Goldwater at one point started calling uh, Casey flapper lips, uh, and toward the end, uh, the two men clashed, uh, clashed regularly. Uh, largely, I think, is the fault of Bill Casey. He could have done a lot more to brief Congress, obviously, and a little, been a lot more honest with them. Doug, is there a lesson we need to take from the collective lives of these uh, gallant men who faced controversy in their later days? Well, there, is, uh, there are some broader lessons. I mean, these four men... Uh, during World War II uh, fought Nazism, uh, and successfully so. And they came away from that war not really, you know, in shell shock, or you don't find any PTSD among these guys, but rather invigorated by their fight against Nazism and ready to carry it over against communism. And each one of them uh, believed in one respect or another that they could fight communism the way they had the Nazis in World War II. And history didn't really repeat itself uh, in this particular case. Uh, and they really came a cropper by, uh, in some cases, uh, learning the wrong lessons from World War II and trying to apply them uh, to the, the new Cold War that we faced. That's certainly an important examination of some past history worth remembering. Now looking ahead to the future, specifically Monday night here on Newsmax Prime, Betsy McCoy and Michael Reagan. A senior fellow from the Hudson Institute, Michael Doran, and Trump supporters and YouTube sensations, Diamond and Silk. For you veterans out there, thanks for your service. Have a great weekend. We will see you back here Monday at 1 on America Talks Live and again at 8 for Newsmax Prime. Stay brave, stay free, stay tuned.